Lofty peaks flanking the gap, river running noisily over the shallows, river was boasting of the victory it had won in breaking its way through, a hunter's paradise abundant with deer. These words were written by American poet, journalist, and longtime editor of the New York Evening Post, William Cullen Bryant, in 1846, following his visit to the Delaware Water Gap. In the 1800s, many people came from New York City, Philadelphia, and other large metropolitan areas to leave the city's hot air and smells during the summer, and they traveled to the mountains to the cool, fresh air. Physicians recommended a mountain vacation for people with health problems. The Catskills, Adirondacks, and Poconos were popular vacation locations. The Delaware Water Gap was the second largest inland resort town in the United States after the Civil War. Its clientele were the upper classes of Philadelphia and New York City. Brian stayed at the Kittatinny House, the first boarding house or hotel in the Poconos. It opened in 1832 and accommodated 25 guests and expanded over the years to accommodate up to 500 <coughs> people. Kittatinny House grew to become one of the largest hotels and the Delaware Water Gap became one of the best known resort towns next to Saratoga. Traveling to the Poconos was not for the faint of heart during this time. A stagecoach ride from Philadelphia took three days and a similar length of time from New York City. Until other places in the Poconos became accessible to visitors by railroad, the Delaware Water Gap was the tourist destination. However, as the railroad industry um, grew, so did the vacation industry in the entire Pocono region. With its high elevation, Mount Pocono became a tourist destination beginning when Mount Pocono train station was built in 1886 by the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad. Mount Pocono became the second largest vacation destination in Pennsylvania behind the <coughs> Delaware Water Gap. Visitors came to this destination by the thousands each summer and scattered into the numerous hotels and boarding houses that the area had to offer. The arrival of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad transformed the Pocono Mountains from a secluded wilderness into a scenic vacation destination. Once New Yorkers and Philadelphians found they could easily make the trip in about three to four hours by train, Mount Pocono and the surrounding communities became the sites of numerous boarding houses, hotels, and resorts. Many families would stay the entire summer while the head of the household went back to the city to work and returned on weekends to join family members. The Poconos offered the middle class an affordable and close alternative to the summer heat of crowded cities. With only a couple hours train ride from the urban areas, vacationers could fish, hunt, swim, hike, bicycle, horseback ride, and relax in the cool mountain air. And sometimes entertainment was arranged by the guests staying in these places. To market the local area's boarding houses in the early 1900s, the Green Drear Chamber of Commerce printed a pr promotional brochure which read, Physicians for years have recommended a change of air as a requirement to health building, su generally suggesting that the city dweller spend his vacation in the mountains, where there is a large preponderance of sunny days combined with the temperature that will allow much outdoor exposure. Whether um, where it is neither too cold or oppressingly warm, where the food is wholesome and the air and water pure. There is probably no section of the country where these conditions are so completely met than is at this region. The Chamber of Commerce brochure listed boarding houses and their proprietors in Newfoundland, South Sterling, Panther, <coughs> Liana, and Greentown, and Angels. Nearly 60 establishments are listed, which is proof that the boarding houses were very popular to the city dweller. They were more affordable than the large hotels elsewhere in the Poconos. Picturesque Pike and Wayne Counties was published by the Stroudsburg Times Press. The booklet touts the pine sweetened air is soft and mild, nights are cool, here nature smiles indulgently upon its visitors. The many mountain brooks delight the angler, the numerous hotels and farmhouses are ready to welcome all city visitors, whether for a short or long stay. Many advertisers in these booklets emphasize the benefit of fresh mountain air as an alternative to city living. Boarding houses, scenic views, and outdoor camping in Liana, Greentown, Newfoundland, and South Sterling were featured in this booklet. 
Caption, captions under the boarding house, photos describe the boarding house, weekly cost, proprietor, capacity, activities, and local train station where guests could be met. The bungalows in the right image, at the bottom left of that image, were owned by and built by Mrs. DeForest Bush of Philadelphia and offered an alternative to the typical boarding house experience. She rented and offered to sell these boarding houses or these uh, bungalows. They offered hot and cold water, baths, mm -hmm. toilets, and large verandas. They were built in the early 1900s, and one of them is owned by one of our society members today. This vacation economy had a trickle-down effect. Some farmers saw extra money in hosting rooms to the city vacationers and supplied resorts with food. Other farmers became full-time innkeepers. Boarding houses were customers, for tradesmen who supplied goods and services, and importantly offered local residents summer jobs. Picturesque Wayne was published in 1904 by the Wayne County Herald and promoted Wayne County as the Switzerland of America. It is a magnet that draws hundreds from the cities to share in the pleasures of the summer season with scores of beautiful lakes, foaming waterfalls, rounded mountaintops, forest-crowned hills, shaded valleys, rocky glens, picturesque villages, and well-tilled farms. Published in 1909 by the Stroudsburg Times Press, the Summer Resort Guide and Road Map highlighted resorts and boarding houses in Monroe Pike uh, counties, including the Poppy Sis and Hazel Inn in South Sterling. I'm not sure how much you're going to see in this map, because um, I haven't seen it enlarged like this, but it represents many of the boarding houses located in Green Township by the red lettering and dots that are there. Many of these boarding houses um, are near water, rivers, lakes, ponds. And here you see the boarding houses of Dreher Township, which primarily follow the Wallenpawpack Creek from north to south. In the early 1900s, hundreds, guests sent postcards to family and friends while on vacation. Thousands of postcards were sent from vacationers who stayed in the Pocono Mountains. Numerous boarding farmhouses were ready to welcome all city visitors, whether for a short or long stay. Many were open from April to December, though the peak season was Memorial Day to Labor Day. Guests made arrangements for their stay by letter or postcard before the widespread use of telephones. Boarding houses were identified by appealing names such as Mountain Rest, Summer Breezes, Meadowside Cottage, Sunset Farm, Pleasant View Farm, Woodbound Cottage, Maplewood Farm, and Brookside Cottage. And in so doing, visitors could picture themselves relaxing on the front porch on a hot summer night with a cool breeze wafting by. Farmers raised dairy cows, chickens, pigs, and planted vegetable gardens, all of which were used to harvest were harvested to feed the city visitors. Huge vegetable gardens were tended for the daily menus, fresh um, meals, local art orchards and berry patches provided fresh fruit, which were made into jams, jellies, cobblers, and pies. Hundreds of quarts of canned tomatoes, beans, applesauce, and corn would be stored up by late summer to be used during the early weeks of the next boarding season. Breakfast was served at 8 a.m. and included hot cereal, eggs any style, pancakes, and waffles. Dinner, the large meal, was served at 12.30 each day and had a special dinner menu. Sundays and Wednesdays were normally reserved for chicken, while other days featured a daily special of roast beef, fresh ham, smoked ham, turkey, or meatloaf. Supper, which was a lighter meal, was set out at 5.30. The late Virginia boast Thomas recalled that Hill, Hilltop's bathroom was in the cellar. That made a big impression on her as a child, and she wondered why the bedrooms would be on the second floor and the bathroom in the cellar. And we really don't know the answer to that. <laughs> they were lucky to have a bathroom at that point. <laughs> Indoor plumbing was not common until the 1930s, so until then, amenities included chamber pots, pitchers of water in the bedrooms, and outhouses. As seen by these two young ladies at Villa Sylvania boarding house, laundry was hand-washed and wrung, 
line dried, and hand pressed. A major operation. Long days beginning at 5 a.m. and ending at 9 at night were normal during the months of July and August. A June 6, 1906 advertisement in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle described Villa Sylvania as a farm boarding house just completed and could accommodate 24 people, and this boarding house is still standing in Greentown. Early transportation to boarding houses was by horse and carriage for the guests who arrived. In 1910, Villa Sylvania was the host to these two bears that provided entertainment for their guests. Early transportation to boarding houses was by horse and carriage for the guests who arrived at Cresco, Goolsboro, or Tobiana train stations, a distance of 10 to 14 miles, and a two-hour carriage ride. Later, the farmer's family car was used to pick up boarders and then drive them back to the station when they were ready to go home. The late Anna London, who lived in Greentown, recalled, Every summer, people would come from the city for their vacations and enjoy living. They would come by train to Cresco, where they would be met with horses and wagons, and once in a while, a car. And they would be taken to a boarding house. Almost every farmhouse had extra rooms, so they would keep boarders for the summer. There was never much for the boarders to do but take walks. So my sister Ruth and I, and brother Don, would go down to the road and meet these guests, and they would give us peppermint candies and tell us a little about city life, how they rode on streetcars to get around, and just to talk for a while. All meals were home cooked over a wood burning stove and served family style. This slide shows the Ferndell located in South Sterling, owned by Fred and Catherine Edwards. Local people, generally extended family members or family friends, provided labor for the boarding houses. Catherine is seen here preparing food on the family's wood stove. Menus featured home-cooked food using fresh eggs, milk, and butter. The butter was churned from the cream that had risen to the top of the milk that had come from the cows, which were milked by hand. By the 1930s, winter activities started to develop in the Pocono Mountains. The establishments that were built as summer-only places were converted to house winter guests. The late Jeanette Bertrand, who lived in Greentown, remembers working in boarding houses. I've worked as a waitress as a teenager in various boarding houses in Greentown. Just about any farmhouse that was any size around here kept boarders. I worked at Sunset Cottage, which was just down at the corner from my home on Hemlock Grove Road, where you turn up to go to Valley View Road. At that time, the people would not come in cars to these places. They would come to Cresco, and all these different farmhouses would have somebody in the family who would run a car or a station wagon down to Cresco and bring them up to their place for two or three weeks, or however they were long they were going to stay. Guests immersed themselves in the farmhouse experience, going on hay rides or picking wild berries in meadows. The Lancaster in South Sterling, which is still standing today, was primarily a boarding house and not a farmhouse. The rooms were approximately 12 feet by 12 feet with two large windows and a transom over the door to assure ample ventilation, a good substitute for air conditioning. But then nights were always cool in the Poconos anyway. An unusual feature was hot and cold running water in all rooms, bath and toilet for general use on each sleeping floor, electric lights, large living room, and a large, well-ventilated dining room, and a broad veranda and spacious lawn. The water supply came from a spring high on a hill, which flowed down by gravity, no pump or electricity needed. Farmers provided the fruits and vegetables until the farming ceased, after which hucksters uh, peddled their wares through the Wallenpalpak Valley twice weekly. The hired uh, people enjoyed the same food as the guests. Delicious pies were baked daily at the Lancaster. There was chicken every Wednesday and Sunday. On Saturday night, the menu included home-baked beans, baked ham, and delicious sticky buns. Friday was a fish day with roast lamb as an alternative for those disliking fish. These young ladies are enjoying the fresh mountain air and sunshine. Most boarders from New York or New Jersey arrived by train to Goolsboro and then by wagon to their destination. Many brought trunks to stay for the whole summer. 
Some came year after year and soon seemed part of the family. Vine Cottage, located on Creek Road in Greentown, met their guests at the train station in a horse-drawn carriage. Hazel Inn in South Sterling could accommodate 30 guests. Later, under different ownership, it was known as the Wall and Paw Pack and expanded to accommodate 50 guests. Unlike most boarding houses, it was open all year and offered hunting, fishing, and bathing for seven to nine dollars a week. It was a relaxing vacation spot with home-like accommodations, including rocking chairs on the wide porch, which was a popular place to read and socialize. The air was dry and invigorating. Meals were served with vegetables from the home garden. With prior arrangements, the Inn's Transportation Service met guests at Toby Hanna Rail Station. Hazel Inn was located just north of the intersections of routes 423 and 507 and still stands today. It may look familiar to some of you. It was The last name was Upper Creek Inn. The paper reported that a musical performed by the Newfoundland Glee Club had been held at Hazel Inn, and it was one of the best that ever had been at the resort. After the musical, guests enjoyed dancing. Guests at the Hazel Inn also went on what the paper reported as straw rides. With a capacity of 20 guests, Cliff Cottage offered hunting and fishing and all outdoor amusements for seven to ten dollars a week. Guests were met at the Goolsboro Railway Station. Does anyone recognize this building? Hotel Ellendale at the corner of routes 507 and 191. Guests could take in a local baseball game or attend a movie at Ward's Lyceum in South Sterling or at the Hobart Theater in Newfoundland. City newspapers reported who was staying at the boarding houses during the summer and on their residence activities in the Poconos. According to the August 14, 1910 edition of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, South Sterling hotels were thronged with pleasure seekers and noted a charity bazaar was held at the Poppysis in South Sterling with proceeds going to the La Anna Methodist Church for charitable purposes. Proceeds from another fundraiser at the Poppysis went to support the Fresh Air Fund for the tenement children in the city. The proprietors also hosted dances every Thursday. Poppy Sis was one of the larger boarding houses with accommodations for 40 people, offering tennis, croquet, baseball, fishing, hunting, and swimming. It was promoted as having pure, invigorating air, no malaria or mosquitoes, <laughs> all outdoor sports, and a good table. Boarding house guests uh, competed with one another in tennis tournaments on grass courts with guests arranging the competitions. You can see a couple of tennis players practicing at Edwards Hall in the lower right corner. Recreation included swimming, walking, shuffleboard, bingo, horseshoe, pitching, quads, berry picking, fishing, baseball, hunting, croquet, croquet tennis, and boating. All this for $7 to $10 a week. Maple Grove Cottage, located outside of uh, Newfoundland on Route 447 was built by Charles and Marie Augustine prior to 1919 as a small farmhouse with two rooms on the first and second floors. The house was then remodeled to provide eight bedrooms for boarders and first operated as a business by their son Charles and his wife Anna. Maple Grove Cottage continued as a boarding house until the 1940s. Charles and Maria's grandson Carl Recall that when the boarding house's bedrooms were occupied by boarders, the family slept in the attic on rope beds because the guests had the good beds. A family member said it was hotter than heck in the summertime in the attic. In the photograph on the left, you can see bicycles leaning against a tree in the foreground. In the photograph to the right, Charles Augustine is seen on the left playing lawn tennis at Maple Grove which still stands today and is owned by one of our society members. Philadelphia and New York newspapers advertised the healthful and scenic wonderland in the Poconos. It was called the Playground of the East, offering excellent fishing, outdoor sports, woodland trails, and a playground for rest and recreation. What's interesting about the Brooklyn Daily Eagles advertisement on the right is that it was published in 1931, during the Great Depression. Throughout the 1930s, boarding houses and hotels in the Green Dreher community continued to advertise and operate while the economy faltered. Pocono boarding houses offered an affordable vacation alternative for the middle class. While not a typical boarding house like I've discussed up until now, 
The Sterling Inn, located a mile south of here, was a family-owned resort which employed many local men, women, and teenagers. It operated as a boarding house beginning in the mid-1800s and until, until 2006. The inn's various owners purchased adjoining cottages and forming, former boarding houses in the area. Over 100 acres of landscaped gardens and lawns and wooded acres created a park-like setting. During the 24 years under the ownership of the Logan family, the inn employed 60 staff, though not all of them were full-time. Recreational activities on the property included two outdoor sh uh, shuffleboard courts, a nine-hole putting green, a spring-fed two-acre lake called Mirror Lake with a beach for swimming and boating, two hiking trails, tennis courts, ice skating, and the inn had skates of all sizes for their guests, sledding, cross-country skiing, the inn had a ski shop with skis and boots of all sizes, cross-country ski lessons, the Logan children actually gave ski lessons to their guests, and horse-drawn sleigh rides, again the Logan children drove the sleigh with their horse midnight, an indoor pool and hot tub. There was also entertainment such as live band on Saturday nights, square dancing, murder mystery weekends, complimentary outdoor barbecue picnics on holiday weekends such as Memorial Day, Fourth of July, and Labor Day. The inn's property was adjacent to one mile of the Wallenpalpat Creek, providing opportunities for fishing. In 1984, owner Ron Logan wrote, Country inns are an escape from the present world of technology. It is a step back into the past where your ears, that are sore at night from too many phone calls, can hear only the sounds of Mother Nature, or interesting conversation from a newfound friend. It's a chance to slow down, relax, and get away from it all. If anything, country inns will probably become more inviting and popular as society marches on to higher technology. Many articles in magazines and newspapers are directed to the increase in traveler preference for country inns. The Philadelphia Inquirer wrote an article in 1982 titled, Country Inns Are In, and the number of inns is increasing yearly. Again, however, only the quality of the inn that is dedicated to excellent personal service are successful. This was and is the motto of the Logan family, who had a 24-year career operating the Sterling Inn. Their excellent personal service can now be enjoyed at the French Manor, operated by their children, Bridget and Genevieve. <laughs>